Hello and wash day, what is going on? Here is another book review that uh, I wanted to share with you. I just finished The Reconciliation Manifesto by Arthur Manuel and Grand Chief Ronald Derrickson. Now, right off the bat, I think that everybody should read this book if you're living in Canada. I think it does a great job at contextualizing the historical context of our people where we're at within the political landscape. I think that's really important to understand how this country was built, policies, and you know the political agenda of this Canadian government and how we can achieve reconciliation and what that really means. So we're gonna get into a lot of those details, but uh, there was a few things that really stuck out to me that uh, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys through this book review. Um, really easy read in the sense of like the words and how many pages. I read this book in two weeks. Uh, I really enjoy books that have short chapters. Uh, I feel as though you, you're more accomplished as you read. So every time you read and it's a short chapter, I feel fulfilled that I completed that little section. And uh, so reading this book, it has you know multiple little chapters that I think are, are really good. And uh, this was just a really good quick read to help you put into context how we can achieve reconciliation in this country and what reconciliation actually means in a tangible sense. So let's dive in. I really, really like this book, so I'm excited to share with you. Now, right away um, on page 26, one of the first things that it puts into perspective, which helped shape the rest of my read throughout this book, was that land distribution. 99.8% of our land in this country is under settler's land, owned by the crown, however you want to put it. So that only leaves 0.2% left to indigenous communities. So when you put that into context, no wonder we're in poverty. No wonder our economic prosperity isn't moving as quickly as the rest of the demographic in this country, white settlers, for example. Um, so to put that into perspective really helps shape my understanding of the challenge we have as indigenous people, the challenge we have as Canadian people, if we wanna achieve reconciliation, the 99.8 in comparison to the 0.2% that indigenous people have needs to be rebalanced. And in order to achieve that is quite simple in its understanding that Canada needs to recognize our rights to self-determination, which gives us our ability to self-govern and, and, and like apply our sovereignty. Now we're always, we've always been sovereign, we're still sovereign, it's just a matter of what that means today and how we can practice that today. And this book does a really good job at helping put that into perspective. So right off the bat, page 26, so earlier on in the book, you already have this like, I already had this perspective of like, wow, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and I wanna be part of the solution. And so for me, that automatically turned on my entrepreneurial hat and I think for me as, a, as an indigenous person, I'm also, uh, I have Caribbean blood, my dad's from Jamaica. So as an Afro-Indigenous person, um, understanding you know, this historical context within this country that I've been born and raised in, I want to buy land as part of my uh, you know, mission to achieve in reconciliation, part of my mission to uh, you know, increase our prosperity for our people is by buying our land back. Unfortunately, we do have to buy our land back um, in the certain, in the sense, the economical sense that we're in right now, um, to get our land given back to us by this Canadian government, that would have to incorporate our right to self-determination. And a lot of that is, goes into detail in this book. So for me, I'm excited. Like now my, my mindset is on buying land. And so that's what I want to be able to do in the future. So right away, page 26, and then on page 76, uh, it helps to put in a, a definition to racism. And the book says that racism is both the justification for your rights to seize our land and a sharp edged tool you use to break the body and spirit of our people to try and ensure that all of us, our children and our elders, wake up in the morning with the feeling of being useless, worthless, helpless, 
in fact less in every way than white Canadians and it tells us that our condition is our fault. Because of this, we undervalue not only ourselves and our communities, but importantly, we undervalue our land. Damn. I think that really puts into perspective the socioeconomic situation of our current, of our people. And so, you know, racism from a, a, a political perspective, this book does, a, I think, an interesting way of defining that. And so that really uh, stuck with me. So I wanted to make sure I shared that with you guys. And so as I continued reading, you know, it's, it, the book makes it really clear. Uh, on page 92, it says, the legal system is founded on a criminal act. Like that, that makes so much sense. The crim, like the, the justice system, the law of Canada was founded on a criminal act, which means the, like our, these lands have been stolen from our people. We didn't give up our, our rights to this land. It was manipulated and taken from us. And so the whole like justice system, the law was founded on like stolen lands. Like it's, this is a criminal act. So I thought that was really interesting to understand it in that way. So for Canadians and, and, and indigenous people, this book is really interesting in shaping your perspective and helping you understand what the political landscape is of our country and helps to put it in a modern t in a modern uh, perspective and so just a few pages after that on 96 this is what was interesting is that finally in 1982 in section 35 in the canadian constitution which is canada's founding document uh, finally indigenous people were recognized and so that just helps us fight for our rights is when the Canadian legislation changes have been made that allow us as indigenous people to apply pressure on the Canadian government to recognize our rights to the land, uh, to our communities and to those sort of, sort of things. So right on page 96, uh, you know, it helps to put in perspective the Canadian Constitution and that in section 35, so if you want to be holding, if you want to hold this country accountable, we have to be able to use the right methods and the right practices in order to achieve that. So I thought that was really important. So right away, section 35 recognizes Aboriginal rights, which is inserted in Canada's founding document. That's really important to understand. So moving forward on page 98, uh, it does a really good job at putting into uh, perspective the definition of reconciliation. Reconciliation is only possible if we have our right recognized as they are in the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples and or the government recognizes our land rights and our fundamental right to self-determination. So in understanding that, it helped me put into perspective that in order for us to actually achieve reconciliation, we have to have our rights recognized. Not only that, but our right to self-determination, which is the ability of self-governance and our sovereignty. That's what that is about. And so understanding that, it like really shaped my understanding about protesting is that if we're gonna protest, the best way of protesting isn't necessarily going to Parliament Hill because Parliament Hill has a boss. And Parliament Hill's boss are the United Nation um, rights bodies. So the international bodies is what will hold can Canada accountable. So if we want to protest, we want to go to the international level. And so when we protest, it's not necessarily going to Parliament Hill. It's going to the international bodies, the United Nation rights bodies. Those are the ones that are going to hold that's going to hold Canada accountable to make sure that the appropriate changes in legislation and government are made in order to respect the indigenous peoples of these of this of this country within Canada. And so that's really important to understand too. And so yeah, protesting is important going to Parliament Hill, but if we really want to achieve reconciliation, it's about our land and our right to self-determination. A lot of the other, you know, social um, things that are going on within our communities are also very important. So I'm not depreciating that. But if we want to achieve reconciliation 
as a whole throughout this country, we need to have our right to self-determination. And so when we go to pay, uh, page 102, which is just a few pages afterwards, I think it puts into perspective a really important um, thing that happened in 97, in 1997. And in 1997, the Supreme Court decision recognized Aboriginal title as a right to the land itself for the Westowitan people. There's another nation that is it also recognized. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, so I don't want to miss uh, pronounce it. So I'm not going to say it, but um, it recognized the principal Aboriginal title as a form of ownership that included economic rights. So in 97, the Supreme Court decided that Aboriginal title as a right to the land itself goes to the Westowitan people. So earlier in 2000, um, earlier this year, in 2019, uh, the Westowitan people were, there was a lot of social media highlighting the po um, problem that was going on with the gas pipeline that was trying to be put through their territories. And they were simply saying no. They have their own sovereign right to say no. And the fact that military police were called in and again, indigenous people are seen as a problem and just a group of people that need to be removed. That is why that was so significant in our history right now. So significant in our present time that the Westowitan people in the 97 Supreme Court case, that they have rights to the land. And so when they say no, that's what it means. It means no. So the fact that again, Canada goes in and just removes our people and makes arrests, that is unjust. They're breaking their own laws according to this understanding of this court case. And so these are the forms of racism that are still happening in this country. Racism in, in, in Canada today is in the form of politics, politics, if you want to put it in a different perspective. And so I think understanding that was really important and uh, it really made me more passionate about understanding the situation that we're in right now as Indigenous people. So page 102 um, puts that into perspective, which I think is, is really important in understanding that. And so when you think about that, when you think about government policy, when you think about uh, legislation, these sort of things, um, you know, there's a different form of colonialism that starts to shape. And on page 132, it defines what's called neo-colonialism, which I thought was really fascinating because I think this is more of a modern form of colonialism that's taking place. And neo-colonialism are groups of people, boards, and organizations that are funded by government to administer colonial legislation some of which are our own people so that the settler Canada can continue to dispossess and maintain control over our territories. In extreme cases, help with the surrender of our lands through large compensation offers. And so what that means is that we have to be careful. Um, we have to be careful that we are not being manipulated with these large compensation offers that change legislation where we're surrendering over our territories and our lands to this government so that they have control over it. That's always been their mission, is to control the territories and the lands so that they can benefit economically. So this book, I'm telling you, is so important in reading to understand all of the steps that led up to, to what that means. And like, it breaks my heart because our own people are being manipulated, whether they're aware, because some of them are very much aware of this manipulation, but a lot of us are unaware that these type of things are happening because of the trickery, of the words that they may use. Um, you know, and this book actually highlights some of those examples of what that means. So neocolonialism is definitely a modern form of trickery of politics that is happening in this nation that I think is really important to know and be aware of. So that was really interesting. And the bodies most capable of dealing with our rights to self-determination 
are the UN human rights bodies. So we talked about that. So in order to prevent a lot of these things from happening, we have to make sure that we're fighting in the right way. We're peacefully fighting in the right way. And to me, understanding, if I understand this book correctly, the best way to peacefully fight is in the international bodies. Now, aside from all of that heavy hearted, um, you know, content, I think that the book did a great job at giving you some relief. The relief is, is that in our current day and age, there's a lot of allies and those allies are really starting to join arms in solidarity. They're starting to, you know, work with us in holding Canada accountable. A lot of those are, you know, the uh, black communities. A lot of that has to do with other newcomers to these uh, to this to this country that also have a similar history of genocide and they're starting to be woke and the cool thing is that not only are they you know the ethnic groups that are joining us as allies but it's also the non-indigenous people so like white canadians they're also noticing and starting to realize the injustice of this country and they're starting to uh, walk beside us and, and join arms in solidarity and to me that is what it, what is exciting and to me reading this book was important for me because it helped me understand the political landscape but I've always tried to focus my energy on the positives. And the positives is that I'm very passionate about working with teachers who are not indigenous, but are passionate about teaching indigenous history and bring in indigenous speakers and indigenous presentations into their schools to be able to do that work. And I'm passionate about those amazing people who are stepping up and doing the best that they can to ensure that our young people are being educated the right way, the truth. So big shout out to all of our allies, all of the teachers that are doing the best that they can to make sure that we can achieve reconciliation in this country step by step. Um, you know, learning as much as we can because education is a very important facet in order to achieve reconciliation. So that was super important and very uh, inspirational is understanding that we have allies. So that's a huge step forward. So that was on page 146. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the rest of this book because there's a lot. There's a lot and it's heavy, but it was, a, it was a short read. I read it in two weeks, which honestly is the fastest I've read any book. So that, you know, I felt very fulfilled to have read this before going into 2020. I wanted to have this clear understanding of where we're at as Indigenous people within Canada before going into 2020 because I have a 2020 vision that I will share with you on another video, so stay tuned for that. So let's move forward into this quick little last thing that I'll share. Um, on page 176, to me, it talks about a matriarch story. And the matriarch story has to do with all of the women who lost their right, their, their, their identity. And that had to do with, you know, the fact that when you marry a non-indigenous person, you lose your, your Indian status. And so for Laval, um, uh, the Laval case, Jeanette Corbier is an Anishinaabe from Wequemecong, spoke English and Ojibwe. She attended business college in North Bay, worked in Toronto as the executive secretary at the Native Canadian Centre of, of Toronto. And in 1965, she was named the Indian Princess of Canada. So that's why I refer to this as a matriarch story because we have a powerful leader here, a female leader that is making changes in her community the best way that she can. And so when I read this story, I was super excited because to me, women are stepping into their power and this world, this country is going to be led by women. It's just a matter of time. So men step aside and make room for our females because they're stepping into their power, their rightful place of leadership. Trust me, I'm excited about that. Jeanette Corbier um, got married in 1970 and within weeks after, um, 
she got a letter that her Indian status was terminated. So protest obviously started to take place. She took this to court, to the Supreme Court. And again, it involved the UN. It involved those international bodies. As a result, amendments were made in the Indian Act that removed that whole policy. So that is a huge, amazing, inspiring story of a matriarch in my perspective. I think this is an amazing matriarch story. So that was very inspirational on top of learning about that we're in this day and age of, of people who are willing to join arms with us in solidarity and advocate for the true reconciliation of this country. So that was very inspiring. And I think, you know, I, I said there, I, that was my last one, but I think there's one last thing that really needs to be put into perspective. And that is, you know, the economical situation. And economically, you know, this book does a great job at putting that into perspective in detail. But something that I think is tangible that anybody can really understand is that Home Depot buys its lumber from BC. Now, Canada is indigenous territories from time immemorial. So the fact that Home Depot buys its lumber from BC, 0% of the profits made go to indigenous people. That's the economic situation is that we're always left out of the equation. Canada's GDP is sitting at $1.6 trillion and the indigenous people's cut is next to nothing. That is the economic situation that we're in right now. And to keep in mind what I said in the beginning, we only have 0.2% of the land. So again, economically, it's unequal. And these things need to be really put into perspective to understand what it is we're fighting for. And so that is the gist of this book. Like I know it's a lot, but I'm excited about this stuff. I'm excited about this content. I'm so grateful that I was able to read this book in my time and at this age um, and it helps me really put into perspective the work that I can contribute and to me I feel grateful that I have an audience to share this information with both in my music and on you know large large stages um, in high schools and anywhere I do presentations this really helped me understand what reconciliation is what it means and how it can be achieved so thank you arthur manuel thank you uh ronald derrickson for putting this book together um it definitely is an important read i think everybody should read it and last but not least i think it was interesting that growing your own food there's a story about uh, a warrior who grew his own food and helped feed his community and uh, i think that's really important which is in this book so go get it but uh, growing your own food is a way that we can practice our sovereignty now i think that's really important to understand because that's like a real simple step that we can take something very tangible something you can do right now is to grow your own food if you are living in a residential area, you probably have a backyard or a front yard. You can grow some food, grow some tomatoes, grow some cucumbers, grow some potatoes, grow some onions, all the things that we use a lot. And when you start to grow your own food and have a dependency on your own, you remove the dependency of grocery stores. And I think that is really important to uh, disconnect from is our dependency on the system so I think growing your own food is a real interesting way of practicing our sovereignty and of course when you grow your own food you have all of the teachings around reconnecting with the land and the fact that when you give to the land the land's gonna give you something back and that relationship is reconciliation that relationship is balance that is why our relationship to the land is so important and our identity is ingrained in it. So when we talk about the dispossession of uh, the land from indigenous people, that's why it's so important because our identity is the land. So the Reconciliation Manifesto has manifested some incredible perspectives for me. Uh, I wanted to share this with you guys. 
and uh, I hope you got something from this book review. I'm trying to read as much as I can. Uh, I try to read a book a month and I wanna put these uh, videos out to share with you guys my insights and my perspectives. So again, I thank you for watching. I thank you for listening. Go get this book. It's a must read.